Well, parallel collections are definitely the easiest way to achieve parallelism in Scala. They're not the most flexible. Uh, they work very well for what is called data parallelism. This is where we have a whole bunch of values and we want to execute the same code on all of those different values. If we want to be able to do something more than that, in particular if we want to be able to execute very different pieces of code and have them have happen at the same time, we need to go to something else. And the appropriate way to do that, to do that in Scala is using what are called futures. Now the concept of a future exists in many different programming languages. They aren't new to, to Scala. Uh, Java has them, C++ has them. They actually have a long history. And it just so happens the ones that are in Scala um, are set up in a way that makes it easier to work with them and not to do what is called blocking, to make it so that your threads that the futures use are never just sitting there and waiting for stuff to happen. So futures are in the scala.concurrent package. There is both a trait for a future and a companion object for the future. And the apply method of the companion object is an easy way to be able to create a future. So we can go ahead and we can write some code that does that. So that was for our parallel collections. Let's go ahead and let's create another app. And we'll call it future test. And the simplest way to create a future is just to call future. When I import this, I want the Scala concurrent future version. Now this still has an error in it. And if we hover over, fortunately this error tells us exactly what it is that we need to do. It's that last bullet there. The fact that, uh, or actually sorry, second to last bullet. The fact that there's, we need an implicit definition of what's called an execution context. So if we import Scala concurrent execution context implicits global, Scala concurrent execution context implicits global. Now this is happy and it runs. Granted, it doesn't do anything. The apply method actually gives us back a future. So a lot of times when we're doing this, we're going to want to give a name to the thing that this gives back. And then we need to make it so that this does something for us. Printing in the future. OK. Now, that was kind of boring. It actually didn't print our message. It turns out that when you run a future, if the main thread terminates before the future is done, the future doesn't keep the program alive. So our program ran, it got to the bottom down here, and it stopped. In order to make it so that this will work, we need to somehow pause the execution of our program. Now we can pause it indefinitely by putting in a statement that will read a line of input from the user to make that so it's not deprecated. We can put in an import. Now if we run this, we get printing in the future there, and if I hit enter, it terminates. To show that this is happening in parallel, this is first print line, this is last. And we run this. This is first, this is last, and then the printing in the future happened before uh, or after the this is last. It didn't have to happen there, and this is one of the challenges with multi-threading is that the order in which things happen can depend upon uh, the thread scheduler. Because this print line is basically immediately after the creation of the future, it's unlikely that the, the print in the future would ever happen 
before this other print line, but you can kind of play with this. If we just want to pause our program for a period of time, we can call thread.sleep and we pass it a number that is a number of milliseconds. So if I pass in a thousand milliseconds here, when I run this, it's going to wait a full second. Now you notice here, printing in the future definitely happened first. Yeah, well, that's because we waited a, a whole second. What about a tenth of a second? If it manages to happen first there. A hundredth of a second still happens. A thousandth of a second? Ah. Now the, oh, and there we go. That's what we wanted to see. I just ran this multiple times, and sometimes it runs, and the uh, print inside the future happens at the end, and other times the print that's after the future happens at the end. So there's a very, you know, the, the computer has to do some work to start up a future and make it happen, and we have no control over when the computer is going to start running that. I realize that I have set up a whole bunch of these here that are just sitting here waiting for my input. Instead of waiting for input, we could have put some longer sleep here, and they would terminate on their own. I guess we could wait maybe five seconds. That's not an L. And then these things would terminate for us. Okay, so anything that you put inside of the future here is going to be executed off in its own thread. And once again, we can look at this. It happens at a delayed time because this is a pass by name argument. So the thing that we pass to apply is called by name and that code will be executed off in some other way. So that shows you how you can set up a future. We'll come back and we'll look at other things that we can do with the future. For example, if this did a calculation for us, how can we get back the value? How can we work with those things?